This elderly lady might look like a sweet old grandma, but she's living proof that there's no age limit when it comes to evil. If it hadn't been for a 911 call that caught every second of her victim's harrowing last moments, she might have gotten away with murder. And her victim? That would be her very own grandson. Okay, how did you get shot? Did shot you? My, my, grandma, my grandma shot me. Your grandma and grandpa shot you? My grandma. I'm gonna die. No. This is the twisted case of Jonathan Hoffman. Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of Jonathan Hoffman, who was taken from this life far too soon. It's 5 p.m. on the 18th of May, 2012, when Max Dashevsky receives a worrying call from his good friend, Jonathan Hoffman. The two are seniors at Farmington Central High School, an alternative high school in the upscale neighborhood of West Bloomfield Township near Detroit, Michigan, where they have been friends since the ninth grade. Oh, we met ninth grade in Miss Lanning's class, which was an English class. We met because I sat by him, and he looks at me, he's like, do you like Tupac? I'm like, yeah, I like Tupac. <laughs> and then Ethan was really good friends with him. Jonathan confesses to Max that he's just failed a court-ordered drug test, a condition of probation that he's been on since police found marijuana in his vehicle two months earlier. Jonathan is worried. His grandmother, Sarah, he says, is furious. 17-year-old Jonathan has been living at his grandmother's condo since his parents' divorce and relocation to Arizona 10 months earlier. Initially, he had gone with his parents, but within weeks of their arrival, the family had received a devastating blow. His younger sister, Jessica, had been diagnosed with a benign brain tumor, requiring multiple surgeries and ongoing medical treatment. Between a new school and his sister's illness, Jonathan had been miserable. So, when his grandmother, Sarah, suggested that he return to West Bloomfield and stay with her while he finished his final year back at Farmington, he had been ecstatic. He would be happy staying there with his friends and finishing out his last year of high school. And she never, ever once told me that there were issues. Not everyone had been happy about the new arrangement. Jonathan's father, Michael, a prominent attorney, had seen some unsettling aspects to Sarah's character over the years. A retired school teacher and mother of five, 74-year-old Sarah could be controlling, meddlesome, and ran a very tight ship. But she and her husband, Fred, age 85, had always doted on Jonathan. And with Jonathan pushing hard to go back, he eventually agreed. That was nine months ago. And now Jonathan was back in his element at Farmington High School, where he is known as a class clown. A super smart kid and a whiz with technology, he'd already earned himself a full-ride scholarship to Eastern Michigan University. Above all, friends know him as someone who is always happy-go-lucky, positive, and upbeat. Which is what makes this particular phone call all the more concerning for Max. Jonathan doesn't sound like his usual self at all. To Max, Jonathan sounds not just worried, but scared. The two friends agree to meet up that night. Jonathan tells Max he'll message him in the next half hour or so to confirm the time that Max can come pick him up. Max waits for that message. A half hour goes by, and there's no word from Jonathan. Max messages, then calls. No one answers. He doesn't know yet, but Jonathan will never answer his phone again. 20 minutes after hanging up from Max, West Bloomfield Township Police receive a 911 call from Brookview Lane, Maple Place Villas. It is the home of Sandra Lane, Jonathan's grandmother. 911, what's your emergency? Help, I've just been shot. Where? Huh? I've just been shot. Where are you at? 
Your chest? Okay, who, who, are your grandparents still there? No. Where do they go? I don't know. You don't know where they went? They shot you though, right? Yes. Okay, stay on the phone, okay. Okay, I, I know we got help on the way. I promise you that. Okay, you said you said uh, you it's in your chest. Yes. Okay. Did you get some kind of? Can you can you walk or do you are you sitting? I'm sitting. Okay. Okay. I don't want you to move. Okay. Just keep on breathing. Okay. And it just happened. Are you there? Keep talking to me. Keep talking to me. Are you there? No. Can you can you keep talking? You can't keep talking to me. Are you there, sir? Sir. Sir. The phone call has been placed by Jonathan, who tells the dispatcher that he's just been shot. When she asks who shot him, he tells her his grandmother. For nearly three minutes, he gasps and asks for help, telling her he's dying. His grandmother, he tells her, was gone for now, but as he's about to discover, it's not to get help. What comes next is nothing short of horrifying. Hello? Are you there? Jonathan pleads to his grandmother before the sound of multiple gunshot fire. After crying out in pain, Jonathan says down the phone, I just got shot again. Help, help. There's a pause before the sound of a woman's screams begin, and a voice shouts repeatedly, let go, let go, let go. And then finally, I'll get you a drink of water. Shortly after 5.30 p.m., West Bloomfield police pull up alongside the manicured lawn of a condo on Brookfield Lane in the quiet, gated community of Maple Place Villas. A neighbor had reported sounds of gunfire. In this enclave of wealthy, mostly retired residents, crime is a rarity, let alone violent crime. But as officers exit their vehicles, they hear two bursts of gunfire ring out from the condo. Before they can enter, a woman appears behind the screen door. After following orders to drop her weapon, the petite elderly lady with fading red hair and blood on her clothes steps out the front door. She raises her hands in surrender and announces to police, I just murdered my grandson. As if this wasn't shocking enough, it's nothing compared to what's to come. Inside the home, officers are confronted by a bizarre scene Blood and bloodied footprints trail through almost every room of the home. There are blood smears on the walls and furniture. Bullet holes in the walls, shell casings littering the floor. Discarded at the front door is a Glock 17 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Later, during a forensic examination of the house, 19 rounds of ammunition and several magazines will be recovered from the home. Upstairs, officers find 17-year-old Jonathan Hoffman. He's lying on the floor, 
face down in a pool of blood with multiple gunshot wounds to his chest, arms, back, and stomach. Most of the shots had been delivered at close range. Paramedics rush him to Bostford Hospital in hopes of saving his life. But by 6 p.m., he has tragically succumbed to his injuries. Two days later, Sandra Lane is charged with open murder in the shooting of Jonathan and held without bond, which will leave it to a jury to decide whether she is guilty of first or second degree murder. She enters a plea of not guilty. Jonathan's family, friends, and neighbors are rocked by grief and disbelief over the shooting. What on earth could have possessed Sandra to shoot and kill Jonathan? The media are quick to get word of the controversial shooting and offer up theories. Word spread that Jonathan had failed the drug test for synthetic marijuana earlier that day, and journalists jump on the narrative of two neglectful parents who had dumped their drug-addled teen on their aging parents who had become overwhelmed. Now, of course, this case dates back to last May. Young Hoffman was living with his grandmother in West Bloomfield Township. Evidence shows that he did have the synthetic drug K2 or spice, a synthetic marijuana, in his system at the time of his death. He had gotten in trouble previously for the same drug, and his death comes on the heels of another high-profile murder in which a young man is accused of killing his father with a baseball bat while high on K2. Sandra Lane's attorney says she felt she had reason to fear for her life. This was a young man that was dumped on her, that was involved in drugs, that was on probation and was difficult to control. How do you choose to leave your child with a grandparent if you have these feelings, if you're feeling angry? I don't know if they remembered what their childhood was like. A hot topic is the synthetic marijuana itself, known as K2 or Spice. Just two weeks before Jonathan's death, a teenager named Tucker Cipriano and a friend had smoked the drug before attacking his family, killing his father and injuring his mother and brother. The drug has not yet been banned and is still sold in some gas stations and convenience stores for as little as $10. Meanwhile, reports are coming out that it causes aggression in users. Had the same scenario played out at Sandra's house, was it her motivation for shooting Jonathan, a tragic case of self-defense? According to the account Sandra would give to the police and later a jury, self-defense was exactly her motivation, or so she would say. Sandra had said that ever since he'd returned to West Bloomfield, Jonathan had been out of control. He was aggressive and defiant, staying out all hours, hanging around teenagers who were heavily into drugs, including Spice. Jonathan, she said, was addicted to the drug. No one had told her before he came to stay or warned her of what she was taking on. And once he'd arrived, his parents had shown little interest in helping him or helping her in how to deal with him. His dad, in particular, she said, had given up on the boy. Meanwhile, Jonathan would regularly go into rages where he would release his anger on objects, destroying things in his room and kicking in the closet doors. You were kind of destructive, you even had to sit. In my house or before he came to live. Let's talk about in your house. Yes, I don't. Uh, God said, uh, if we were disagreed uh, over an issue or something in his life was disturbing him, he would take it out on things. Um, he would go as far as breaking his own equipment. He was a computer. I guess you could call him computer geek since he was a very young. Then Fitzfinger or times when things didn't go his way, when break his own equipment. On it or so various technical things he had in his room. I don't know what they're called. How are you going? He used to use kick 
He didn't kick anything. He kicked in closet doors. He clicked, kicked it on monitor. Screamed. Did you replace the monitor? Yes. Did you fix the doors? Yes. And place the phone? Yes. Were you afraid when he did these things? Yes. I would, I would remove myself and would tell calm down and I was afraid and I would remove myself until he calmed down. Police confirmed the account of Jonathan's drug use. On March the 17th, 2011, Jonathan had been pulled over and ticketed for marijuana possession and drug paraphernalia. Later, at a court hearing, he had received a 93-day suspended sentence with 12 months of probation and mandatory random drug tests. Friends of Jonathan's revealed to police that they had been concerned over his use of drugs and had tried their best to discourage him from using them. Sandra had done her very best to get Jonathan to clean up his life, focus on his grades, and follow her rules. But he had defied her at every turn, and was volatile, erratic, and violent. Her husband, Fred, confirmed that there had been constant and heated arguments between Sandra and Jonathan since the moment he'd arrived. Several times, Sandra said that she had called the police because Jonathan had been so out of control. She'd also called the school for help, but to no avail. On one occasion, she said, he had been so out of control while high on drugs that hospital staff had to strap him to a gurney. She pleaded with his parents to help her, but his father had not even bothered to come back to Michigan. She began to worry that Jonathan might kill her. She confided in her husband that she was scared of him and his friends. Desperate to keep her and her elderly husband safe and feeling out of options, she purchased a Glock 17 for protection on the chance that Jonathan or his friends attacked them. You told him that you were fearful of the friends, right? And you had told him that you were fearful to the point that you wanted the jewelry to be hidden, yes? Yes. Okay. And you're bringing a gun into your house, yes? Yes. Uh, a gun is a, you know, is a dangerous weapon, yes? yes? A gun, you know, can cause great bodily harm, yes? Yes. On the fateful day of May the 18th, she had driven Jonathan for his drug test that morning. The results had come back positive for Spice, and he had been required to come back for a second test later that afternoon. When that test had also come back positive, he had gone into a rage. In the car, he had been cursing and using street language, she said. He had repeatedly kicked the dashboard and grabbed at the steering wheel. Three times, she had to pull over, and once he tried to take the car keys. Once at home, the argument had escalated even further. Worried that he would go to jail, he planned to immediately leave for Arizona and was demanding $2,000 in cash from her and her car. She had refused to give him either. With her husband Fred out walking the dog, she was both terrified and desperate to talk some sense into him. So she had gone downstairs to her bedroom and retrieved the loaded handgun. She told the police, I wanted him to hear me. I wanted him to pay attention to me, that I would not give him the car. I would not let him take the car. I would not let him take the money. He had to listen. She had then climbed up the stairs back to Jonathan's bedroom with the loaded gun, where she found him in the bathroom. Instead of listening to her, he had sworn at her and lashed out, kicking her in the stomach and striking her on the head. You were walking to the law himself? Yes, I did. All right, now you're in the loft. Yes. So you're walking to the loft, and you, did you have a conversation with him? Yes. What kind of conversation? It wasn't have? a conversation. Huh? Or did we? What is he saying to you? Swearing. He's yelling. Is he telling you he's taking the car? Yes. Where did he kick you? <laughs> there. Did he strike you? In the head. Sorry? In the head. In the head area? And what happens? 
else what happens when he kicks you when it strikes you? <laughs> he shot the gun. How many times did you shoot the gun? I don't know. What happens when you shoot the gun? It was a struggle. What kind of struggle? He's running after me. And what are you doing? I'm running away. After a violent struggle and frenzied pursuit around the house, she had fled to the basement to hide. What are you trying to do? I get away. Stop him. So you're trying to get away from him. And why are you trying to get away from him? Yes, it. Next time. Scared. You're scared. What are you scared of? He's scared. She had finally come out to see if he was all right, but he attacked her again and tried to grab the gun. They had struggled, so she fired to save herself. You remember yelling, let go, let go, let go? Yes. Do you shoot, if you remember? Why are you shooting? I don't know. You just do. I don't know. Are you still afraid? Yes. It sounded like a tale of two overwhelmed grandparents in over their heads, a situation that had ultimately led to Sandra tragically shooting and killing her beloved grandson out of fear that he would hurt or kill her. But was this really how things unfolded? As the investigation gained traction, an altogether different picture of events began to emerge, and while just as tragic, it was far more chilling. First of the questionable statements that Sandro had made about Jonathan's violent nature, extensive interviews with those who knew Jonathan revealed that no one had ever known him to be violent. He had a reputation as a joker and a pacifist. At school, he was more likely to break up fights with humor and wit than to pursue them. Friends claimed to have seen no change in Jonathan in recent months, those who watched a movie with him the night before the shooting said that he was his same goofy self. Jonathan also had a very slight build. At just 5 feet 5 inches tall, weighing 110 pounds, he was not an imposing hulk of a boy, or more or less he was similar to the size of his grandmother. It would seem that only Sandra had seen Jonathan's violent rages, but even that now came into question. Her husband, Fred, said that he had seen the pair argue constantly and heatedly, but had never witnessed any violence of any kind, despite being in the house pretty much all of the time. He had noticed Sandra taking on responsibility for Jonathan in a very intense way. She regularly checked in with his teachers about his grades and set strict rules and guidelines for Jonathan. He hadn't followed them, and things had gone off the rails. Fred remembered telling Sandra to send the boy back to Arizona to his parents, but she had refused. Which brings us to her claim that Jonathan had been dumped on her. Her daughter, Jennifer, told police during the nine months that Jonathan had stayed with Sandra, he spoke to his mother every day and spent weekends with them once a month. In all that time, her mother had never once mentioned any problems between her and Jonathan, nor hinted that she couldn't cope or ask for help. In fact, quite the opposite. When Jennifer discovered that Jonathan was in trouble with the police for drug possession, she had argued with her mother over what to do with him. Jennifer had wanted to send him to a drug rehabilitation center or to take him back to Arizona. But her mother felt strongly that he should stay with her. In the end, Jennifer had given in and made the fateful decision to leave Jonathan in her care. It was true that police had been called to the home, but only on two occasions. On one of those, in March of 2012, Jonathan had called them himself after taking magic mushrooms and becoming paranoid that he was dying. According to the police report, when officers arrived at the home, he had not been aggressive, just scared. He had jumped into one of the police officers' arms. He had then been strapped to a gurney for his own safety. Four days after the magic mushroom incident, it had been Sandra who had called 911. 
She told dispatch that Jonathan was in a rage and trying to run away. Meanwhile, Jonathan told the operator that she was trying to get him into her car so he couldn't leave. In other words, she wanted to trap and lock him in her vehicle. Sandra could then be heard saying to Jonathan, I love you. I want us to get some help. When police arrived at the home on Brookview Lane, they found Jonathan shouting profanities in the street and being derogatory towards his grandmother. Police had offered to take action against Jonathan, but Sandra had insisted that she would handle it, and the incident had been written up as a typical parent-child verbal confrontation that had been resolved. To police, this was seeming less and less like a case of a violent teen spinning out of control and more like a case of a controlling matriarch determined to exert her will on an unruly teen. But it was the hearing held on April the 12th for drug possession and the probation that followed that that seemed to tip Sandra over the edge. Until then, she had been determined to get Jonathan back onto a respectable path. But with graduation just around the corner and her window of opportunity getting smaller by the day, it was looking more and more like a doomed mission. At this point, Sandra had many options. She could have called her daughter. She could have sent her grandson to rehab. Instead, she bought a semi-automatic pistol and took shooting lessons at a gun range. Sandra was determined to win this battle of wills and gain control over her wayward grandson whatever the cost. Four days after Jonathan was placed on probation, Sandra Lane applied for a permit to carry a gun, and on April the 18th, she bought herself a semi-automatic 9mm Glock. She told the shop owner that it was for home protection. The gun she chose was a shoot-to-kill weapon. Along with it, she purchased a speed loader and a box of ammunition containing hollow-point bullets, which are designed to cause a maximum amount of damage to a target. She then took shooting lessons at a nearby gun range until she felt proficient at handling it. All the while, she kept her new skills secret from her husband, who had no idea that there was now a gun in the house. Where they said that Sandy had a gun. And what was your reaction to that, sir? I was flabbergasted. Flabbergasted meaning what? Thinking that Jonathan had the gun. So you were surprised that in fact it was your wife. Is that correct? Yes. Did you know that your wife had purchased, had gone and gotten a uh, permit to purchase that gun? No. Did you know that your wife had in fact, prior to May 18th of 2012, purchased a gun? No. Did you know that your wife had taken or gone to a shooting range and shot or practiced shooting? No. On the day of the murder, Sandra and Jonathan had arrived home sometime after 4.30 p.m. During his interview about the day of the shooting, Fred Lane mentioned something that had struck the police as curious. When Sandra had returned home with Jonathan, she had asked Fred to take the dog for a walk and specifically requested that he not return until she'd told him to. They had to stay out so long the dog had become tired and the two sat watching a basketball match. I was getting tired and the dog was getting tired. Okay, all right. So we uh, watched uh, a basketball game uh, sitting on the grass and I heard the sirens, the fire department and the police. And I thought to myself, well, I hope it's not John. Why had Sandra wanted Fred out of the house? Rather than the actions of a woman in fear of her life, it seemed more like the behavior of someone with a plan that they wanted to act out without interference or possibly a witness. Fred had agreed to go, something which also seemed unlikely if Jonathan had been a raging maniac that Sandra had described. But the really damning evidence against Sandra was still to come. At 5 p.m. that day, Jonathan had answered a call from his friend Max, confirming their plans for that evening. Max told police in an interview that Jonathan hadn't sounded angry or high, but scared. He had been scared about failing the drug screening test and was scared of his grandmother, who he said was so angry she had been threatening to send him back to Arizona. 
Autopsy results combined with forensic evidence revealed that when the first shot had been fired, Jonathan had been wearing shorts, socks, and standing in his bathroom. He had not been about to leave the house for a quick getaway to Arizona in his grandmother's car with $2,000 of her money. He was scared. He had been getting ready for a night with his friend and had arranged for that friend to pick him up. Sandra claimed that she had been violently assaulted by Jonathan in the head and stomach before she had shot the gun. But in the immediate aftermath of the shooting, she was examined by medical staff at a nearby hospital and found no injuries or marks. When asked if her grandson had hurt her, she gave a definitive answer. No, he's a good boy. He would never hurt us. He would never hurt anyone. Ballistics evidence showed that Sandra had pulled the trigger 10 times in various locations around the house, hitting Jonathan five times. Two of those shots had been to his back, suggesting he was trying to get away from Sandra as she was shooting. Another had been delivered to his abdomen while he was laying incapacitated on the phone to 911. Blood on the landline phone downstairs was also found to be Jonathan's. He had answered the phone to a neighbor who rang after hearing gunshots. During the call, he told the neighbors that he had just been shot. Not exactly the actions of someone chasing down a terrified old lady, but was more of a frightened boy seeking help. Police now believe that rather than chasing Sandra around the house, it was Jonathan being chased by Sandra. At some point, Sandra had gone down to the basement to reload the gun, and it was likely at that moment that Jonathan had gone upstairs to his bedroom to call 911. Smears on the wall suggested that by this point, Jonathan had been crawling. She had then gone back upstairs and discharged her weapon at close range into the boy who was incapacitated on the floor, this time striking him in the stomach. Toxicology reports would offer a final, damning blow to Sandra's claim of self-defense. The report revealed that Jonathan had no drugs in his blood at the time of the shooting and only a metabolite of spice in his urine. A medical examiner would state that the drugs found in his urine proved that it had exited his system and had no effect on his behavior. In other words, Jonathan had been stone-cold sober when Sandra had opened fire on him while standing in his bathroom. During the Oakland County trial, Sandra's defense would argue that Sandra was a big-hearted lady who had taken in a troubled teen when his parents had left him behind. He'd repaid her by taking drugs, getting arrested, and terrorizing her with his violent outbursts and, on the day of the shooting, had been threatening her to the point that she feared for her life. The gun had been her last resort. She'd only fired when he wouldn't stop, and she was devastated by her actions. She had only ever tried to save Jonathan. The state would counter those claims, arguing that Sandra had plenty of options if she had begun to feel threatened by Jonathan. Instead, she chose to buy a gun. When he'd failed his drug test, she told her husband to leave the house, suggesting premeditation, and then confronted him with a deadly weapon. She had been the one to fly into an uncontrollable rage at her inability to control Jonathan. She had been the aggressor. She had ruthlessly shot him as he fled to different parts of the house, leaving a trail of blood behind him. She had been determined to make him listen. Now she was determined to take his life. Even when he'd thought he was safe, she reloaded her weapon and followed him upstairs to shoot him again. She hunted down John Amin Parkman because he wins. Listen. Prosecutor Paul Walton said, You don't get to use a gun because somebody's using bad language. You don't get to shoot someone because they raised their voice. Noting that minutes went by before Sandra shot the boy again, he said he had never handled a homicide this cold, this long, and this calculating. The jury rejected Sandra's self-defense claim. On March the 19th, 2013, Sandra Lane was found guilty of second-degree murder in the killing of her grandson. 
Before her sentencing, Sandra begged and whimpered her way through a long, self-pitying appeal to the judge. I don't know what else to say. I don't know. I have to spend all my time. I don't know. 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 I'm so scared and sorrowed. I don't know. I don't know. Her daughter, Jennifer, meanwhile, asked for the maximum sentence. Sandra Lane is pure evil, and if given the opportunity, would surely kill again. She has no remorse or conscience. Her only concerns are for herself. During her sentencing, the judge zeroed in on why she didn't call the police or leave the house if she felt threatened. I wonder if you really felt so violated and so afraid and a need to shoot, why did you keep shooting it on the charge of homicide, second degree murder, that you serve 20 to 40 years in the state prison as she did? To the press, Jennifer Hoffman described her mother as a monster who was obsessed with academic performance and could be evil. It's really hard to comprehend that your own mother could do something like this to your own child. Everything she said in her statement was a lie. She is a complete narcissist and liar. I wish I had seen signs of how evil she was before I left her with my son. I just know that my son is in heaven and that's a place she'll never see. Jonathan's father, Michael, said Sandra had put on her war paint and went gunning for my son. I'm just glad that she's put away and she can't do harm to anybody else. How would you have described Sandra Lane before all this? Uh, she was always a thorn in my side, to be very honest. She was very difficult, um, uh, very meddlesome, very controlling, and uh, I never liked her. He was murdered in cold blood, Jonathan's aunt, Judy Metzger, said. He was executed. Jonathan's funeral was held on May the 22nd, 2012. A rabbi urged mourners not to dwell on how Jonathan died, but instead to celebrate how he lived. Despite the fact that he died at the tender age of 17, these were enormous years of laughter and joy for everyone that knew him. Rabbi Joshua Bennett said. At the funeral, family and friends shared stories about the teenager to the 700 mourners who were in attendance of the service. Jonathan's sister Jennifer said she had a terrific brother. She said one fond memory that especially stood out was that she was seven years old and her brother was nine, and he had cut her hair into a mullet. The bottom line is, John is the kind of big brother that every girl wishes for, she said. Three of his friends spoke. One said Jonathan had the intelligence level of a genius and was great at bringing smiles to people's faces, and that he was unafraid for being himself. No matter what situation it was, he would always make us laugh, even if we were crying or angry, the friend said. He was one of the funniest kids I know, said Adam McCool, age 17, one of the friends who watched The Dictator with Hoffman the night before he died. He was never violent. He was always a giving person. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.